family matter. I couldn't believe how that just sprung out like some wildfire. Never was said. And the fact that that became sort of a, uh, really the kind of uh, narrative that escorted us along the way was just so shocking to me because for all my years as a supervisor and before then, I wasn't just an ally of the DV community, I was an outspoken advocate. Seven years on the budget committee, often in our meetings would go midnight to 2 a.m. in the morning. I'm the guy, one of the people who were like, we gotta get the ad back funding for domestic violence consortium from everybody else. None of this which has been portrayed in this process is accurate about who I am or what my politics are. What is accurate is that I made a mistake. My wife knows I made a mistake. She was the first one out to say, we want our family together. My husband, in an opinion piece that she wrote about in the Chronicle that they published on April 6th, who I haven't talked to, by the way, or seen since January 13th, I haven't talked to my wife or seen her for four months. I read that piece when everybody else got to read that piece. My immediate impression of that piece was, it's a love letter. I am so, I so terribly miss my family. And the fact that I had only seen my son for two hours that they allowed me to before he left for Venezuela and now intermittently by Skype is only indicative of just this is what they want to along this process and the journey of this process to just break down, cave in, walk away. I get it, I do. But at this point, now that it's morphed from the legal, the Hall of Justice into City Hall, this is where it does become political. This is where I am trying to muster the energy. This is where I am trying to go to people who've been friends people who might now be skeptical, people who need to hear from a perspective that they haven't heard from. And that's why I'm trying to avail myself to you here tonight. It's not scripted, it's incredibly clumsy, uh, and I have never been so less footed, sure-footed in my life than now. But it's important you at least get that, I think, that piece of information. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions. So thank you for your time, and I know your night's been long. And I'll answer anything as best as I possibly can. Ross, I hear there's a, a growing support committee. How do people join in? Because I, I know some folks whose names I won't mention that are, you know, a committee that supports you. There's, there's, I have to tell you, I've been um, not involved in this stuff. i am really been, I was wiped out. I mean, just so wiped out, and try to be strong. I, but I can't tell you what it means for me to be suspended without pay. I had to make the decision of saying to my uh, wife's attorney that it makes total sense they're in Venezuela and Caracas. They were getting harassed because she wasn't a victim enough in some ways, or not saying the right things, and she couldn't stand it. And I can't provide for my family. So I, I receded backwards. And in that regard, uh, other people are sort of uh, ramping up, I think, uh, ways to support me. I know uh, Dick or Bruce or maybe uh, can do so. There's a flyer going around. I don't know if it says there's anything. It's got my wife's op-ed on it, and she looks hot. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> Can I answer any other questions? There's been so much reported in the press. I'm, yes? Explain that your wife's going to the next door neighbor, the video tape, and all that. Sure. This happened, the, I guess, the next day. It did, in the next morning. And sorry if I'm bouncing around. I'm still trying to get it down myself um, <clears throat> in telling it. Um, our neighbors, uh, my wife felt the need uh, to uh, go to the neighbor who she thought was an attorney. Uh, her name is uh, Ivory Madison, who thought was an attorney, and to share with her what had happened the day before. Uh, I had learned uh, some days later that this had happened uh, and that a video was made because of an argument that our wife had had about her 
impending trip to Venezuela and our disagreement about taking our son. Uh, I did not know about any video uh, until on January 4th. So four days later, my wife called me up. She's absolutely panicked, completely panicked, because she learns of the fact that uh, this neighbor calls the police without my wife's consent uh, and decides to hand over all this information. That's not what my wife wanted. She ran down Grove Street uh, to City Hall. We live at Webster and Grove. Ran, met her late, late in the afternoon, and she proceeded to tell me everything that had happened. And I was just in a state of shock um, because I didn't know what the truth was, quite frankly, what was going on here. I was the last to find out. Uh, and my wife felt uh, that uh, this neighbor took it upon herself to do something that my wife did not want whatsoever. Uh, and that was what happened. That's what happened. And I was never involved in that dynamic at all between those two. Is there anything else about that? Yes, yeah, but why would she feel the need to go? Oh, custody. I think it was. I think clearly that some strain over uh, the previous few months uh, and our disagreement about uh, her taking our son and her going for extended periods of time uh, to Venezuela. This was becoming a question of custody that she was talking to the neighbor about. I did not know this, and she explained this. Uh, I think either in an interview or an op-ed, but that's why she felt the need to do that. And that became more clear uh, as our investigation, the investigation unfolded. I did not know that. And that's my fault. I didn't see the signs. Uh, and earlier on, when we should have gone to couples counseling, uh, and I procrastinated, that's the best way I think I could sum it up, uh, that's something I'll regret always and look forward to us to go to couples counseling. Uh, again, we have tried during this whole process, and twice we've been rejected by the DA and by the courts. They wouldn't allow us to go to couples counseling. So uh, maybe we would have been able to address some of those concerns early on. It goes uh, Monday the 23rd is the first meeting of the Ethics Commission. This is entirely unprecedented for San Francisco. So there are really no, it, it's unchartered. So they're figuring out what the rules are. And um, it's a little, you know, a, a little scary because it's just completely uninvented. So they're in the process of sculpting that together. Um, the commissioners are political appointees picked by the mayor, the DA, city attorney, assessor, and the board of supervisors. Uh, they render a decision after cases are presented, and then that's presented to the board of supervisors. And then it's, um, I believe, a requirement of uh, nine votes uh, in order to affirm uh, the uh, determination. <clears throat> that's my understanding of the process. And I think that, you know, right now the city attorney is conducting an investigation and, and that hasn't provided for the reciprocal process like in a criminal case. There's no discovery, nothing's exculpatory yet right now, so we haven't been able to provide in kind that same level of uh, evidence procedure. And that, that's worrisome too. So you have no access to their investigation? No, we have nothing. They, they presented nothing. We have no to their investigation as well. So it's one, I mean, it's coming from them, and I really want us to cooperate and collaborate, but it makes it hard because it's extremely uneven. But, you know, this is part of that new process. Anything else I can answer about anything? Well, I have a yes. question. Given that this is completely unprecedented, and I have no idea how any of this goes on and it's still running out here on a rail, but I guess it's a two-part question. Are you allowed to have conversations with current supervisors? I mean, these guys and gals are your friends. I mean, people like Compost and Avalos and Mar. 
or are you either a not allowed to speak to them at all or are you being counseled no don't talk to them they're running for office this is a delicate political situation which now just cycles it back around and makes it a political situation what do you what, what you're pretty upfront guy ross i mean are you talking to these people no and i'm not just like i'm not talking to my wife i mean it, I, i'm respecting rules that are spoken and unspoken and in this case they're unspoken rules but i am not as I saw, I walked in here, I'm looking around the room, and it, oh, there's a supervisor, I left. Um, and I didn't want there to be a chance uh, encounter, quite frankly, not because of me, but because of them. I want to respect their position. You know, as, as progressive as I am, I do believe in our system, and I try to believe in it. It's as unchartered and as sort of unproven as it is. kind <coughs> of... <coughs> Well, I can uh, speak to that. I, I think. Uh, say that out loud. Sorry. <laughs> I, I think David meant this uh, to, to be repeated. I hope I'm not making a mistake. But he he left for that reason. He's been advised that he should not be hearing. That's fine. You discuss it. But other people can, if they want to, certainly with them. And I think the supervisors, I expect that they'll probably be just um, kind of demure about it, take information in. And, and, and that's how it will probably go. Um, but, you know, to see your life be judged in this particular way for an incident that hasn't been well told and the narrative not accurately, I think, displayed, uh, it's hard to sit back. So I wanted, this is my first night I'm doing this. I haven't talked to anybody. So I have to, and I chose you all. <laughs> so, I mean, on this night, I chose you all in Milk Club because I feel such uh, incredible, I mean, the simpatico I've always felt with this club. Um, and I don't mind being 